Okay, uh, hello everybody. Uh, welcome to this uh, special open day uh, lecture on, uh, on the material science. Um, before I start, let me introduce myself. My name is, is Pete Nellist. Um, I'm a professor of materials in the Department of Materials, and I'm also um, co-head of the department as well. And I'm also a tutorial fellow at Corpus Christi College here in, here in Oxford. And I would encourage you as part of your virtual visit to the university to also go and look at the colleges, at the college sites uh, for the seven colleges that admit to material science. And you can find a list of those that admit to material science on the departmental website if you go to the departmental website. Now, um, this is a new experience for me, um, hosting a open day in a virtual sense. Um, normally I'd be giving this lecture in, in person. Um, and, and the lecture is, is a bit of an edit of uh, various lectures I've been recording recently for outreach purposes. And so if during the lecture you observe my background change or the way I appear change, that's just part of the edit. Apologies, apologies for, for that. Um, what I'm going to talk about a little bit is about how um, we can use electron microscopy really now to look at atoms and how atoms are arranged in materials uh, and how by observing how atoms are arranged and bond inside materials, that can help then progress our development of, of materials. But let me just start with, with this slide, which I think is a helpful slide to sort of set the context for the development of, 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 of material science. Materials have always been important to us as a, as a civilization. We've named whole historical eras after materials. We've got the Stone Age, the Bronze Age, and the Iron Age. And, and of course, stone, bronze, and iron are all materials. And so if we go back into prehistory, as you can see here in this slide, you can see, and this is really what we've got here is a plot of the relative importance of different materials types as a function of time. And going back to prehistory, as you might expect, the sorts of materials that, that we were using would be stone and flint, um, straw and, uh, um, and woods and skins and so on. And as time went on, the importance of metals increased and we start to see the use of bronze and then iron as I've as I've mentioned and of course that continued up through the Industrial Revolution the developments of steel and, and the availability of steels uh, and, and, and then uh, coming into the 20th century um, alloys and so on and also the emergence of uh, polymers as, as well plastics um, but then we can see around the sort of mid 1950s or so there's a real change in materials and suddenly we start to see much more complex materials starting to emerge more complex engineering ceramics for example that we might use um, in in uh, jet engines um, various types of complex composites combining two different types of materials much more um, uh, sophisticated plastics and, and polymers and much more complicated alloys um, in, uh, uh, in, in the metallic um, area. So you might ask, well, what happened in the, in the mid-1950s that caused this substantial change in our use of, of material science? Now, the Department of Materials at Oxford was founded in 1956, but I'm, I'm not claiming that our department alone was responsible for all this dramatic change in, uh, in material science. It was around this time, in this post-war era, that material science really started to emerge as a recognised discipline, scientific discipline, in its in its own right. But the other thing that that also happened in the 1950s was the start of the commercial availability of electron microscopes. And as I mentioned, my research area is the use of electron microscopes to look at atoms inside materials. And I want to tell a little story. Let's tell the story of how we've got to the point of being able to see atoms in the in the electron microscope. Um, and and how we and how we how we use them and to start to start that story we need to understand why use electron microscopes and why not use microscopes based on light why do we go to the expense and bother of using uh, electron microscopes and that really comes down to the concept of resolution so resolution is really refers to if you like the smallest feature size that we can see in, a, in an object strictly speaking actually it's the distance between two separate objects uh, that we can distinguish in an image taken in a microscope um, as being two separate objects and if they come too close together they might just merge blur out together and merge to become looking to, as though they look like a single a single object and that's the concept of, of of resolution and to explain why we have to use 
uh, electrons uh, in uh, rather than light to look at atoms, we need to revert back uh, to a theory that was developed in the late 19th century by a scientist working in, in Germany, Ernst Aber. So we're going to now consider the Aber theory of image formation in the microscope. Now, some of you are hopefully uh, doing physics A-level, um, and you'll have come across the concept of diffraction. And Abbe realized that um, imaging was really re very closely related to the process of diffraction. For those of you not doing A-level physics, don't worry about this section. I'll come to the main conclusion at the end, which will be easier to, to understand. But let's consider the experiment that Abbe was thinking about. And here we've got a, what we call a diffraction grating, which is just a screen, really, with lots of, of of equally distant space slits in the screen. And Abbe was really thinking of this as being an object that we might want to form an image for, from in a microscope. So we illuminate our object with some, some radiation. Um, and because we've got an array of equally spaced slits, we get diffraction. So we get a set of diffracted beams. And what Abbe said was that the job of the objective lens, the main imaging lens here, is to capture some of this diffracted radiation, some of these diffracted beams, and then to refract them, a lens is a refracting object, uh, and to bring them to a point in this plane here, which we refer to as the back focal plane of the lens. So if I was to have a diffraction, a, a, a diffraction grating like this one here, and I was to put a screen in the back focal plane of my lens, I would see a nice diffraction pattern of, uh, of fringes that you might be, expect associated with diffraction grating. What Abbe said then happens is as we let the waves keep propagating, keep moving down to this plane here, which we call the image plane, which is where we have the screen and where we or the eyepiece and where we can see the image, what Abbe said is the waves then all re-interfere with each other and to produce the image. And so Abbe said, really, imaging in the microscope is a two-step process. First of all, we have diffraction, uh, and the lens captures some of this diffraction, and then the diffraction can then interfere with itself to reform uh, an image. Now, there's a fundamental issue here, and this is one of the things I'm going to be asking you about, perhaps in a Q&A session after this talk, if there's one available. What happens to the angle of the diffracted beams as the slits here get closer together? So what we're saying here is that as our feature size, if you like, gets smaller, what happens to the um, angle of the, of the diffracted beams? And perhaps more importantly, what happens if the distance between the slits gets starts to approach the wavelength of the radiation used. In fact, you can show that if the slits become smaller than the, the distance between the slits becomes smaller than the wavelength of the radiation used, um, then you do no longer get diffraction. And what Abbe said is in fact, that you know, therefore will no longer form an image. So to bring it all back, having gone through all that theory, what basically Abba was saying, was that you'll never see anything smaller in the microscope than the wavelength of the radiation that you're using in that microscope. And light, uh, visible light, typically has a, has a wavelength of somewhere around 500 to 700 or 800 um, uh, uh, nanometer, uh, um, nanometer wavelength. Um, and um, so, say, about half a micron. And so what Abe was saying is that the um, microscope will never be able to see features smaller than about half a micron, um, or about half times 10 to the minus 6 of a, of a meter. That's quite, that's a, that's a reasonable resolution for many biological objects. But if you're interested in looking at atoms and the distance between atoms, the distance between atoms is about 0 0.2 of a nanometer. So you've got no hope of being able to be able to see atoms using light and essentially that's one of the fundamental reasons that we then have to go and start thinking about electrons because one of the uh really fundamental parts or developments of in physics in the 20th century was this uh, was the idea of wave particle duality and that says that a particle like an electron has both a particle nature and a wave nature now in a in the sorts of electron microscopes that i use we typically use a 100 kilovolt power supply um, to accelerate our electrons, 100 kilovolt power supply isn't a particularly difficult thing to, to make. Actually, it's a it's a, you know it's a sort of box, large box size thing that sits in the corner of, of the lab, gives us 100 kilovolts. Uh, if we then accelerate electrons through 100 kilovolts, 
they then have 100 keV kinetic energy per electron. Uh, if you work it out, these electrons are traveling at about half the speed of light, so they're zipping along pretty quickly. And this chap down here, uh, Louis de Broglie, uh, uh, realized uh, that, uh, that we could calculate the wavelength of these electrons, and he's thinking about this wave particle duality. The wavelength of the electrons is given by uh, Planck's constant, which is one of the fundamental constants of science, divided by the momentum of the electrons. If you put all the numbers in, you find that 100 keV electrons have a wavelength of about 3.7 picometers. A picometer is 10 to the minus 12 of a meter. A nanometer is 10 to the minus 9 of a, of a meter. So, as I said earlier, typical interatomic distances are around 0.2 of a nanometer or 200 picometers. So what we can now see is that we have electrons with a wavelength um, which is much smaller than typical interatomic distances. And therefore, with electron microscopes, it should be no problem to see individual atoms. Now, here's a bit of history. Um, going back to the 1950s, one of the first commercial um, electron microscopes delivered in the UK, a so-called Siemens Elmiscop-1, um, was delivered um, to the uh, Cavendish Laboratory, which is the Department of Physics, at the University of Cambridge back in the in the uh, early 1950s and at that time this chap Peter Hirsch um, who um, uh, back in, then in the 1960s moved to Oxford and was actually head of the materials department my own department here at Oxford for 23 years uh, and he's still he's still involved with uh, with research uh, in, in the department um, but back in the 1950s uh, Peter Hirsch was very interested in using this microscope to look at diffraction from very, very thin foils of metal. This microscope had actually primarily been used for looking at biological samples, looking at cells and so on, but he was interested in looking at, uh, at the scattering involved with the very, very thin sheets of, of metal. So why did he want to look at, at, at metal? Well, what he wanted to do was to explain um, one of, uh, what I think is one of the most interesting uh, experiments that you can do in material science, and it's incredibly straightforward, and you can all do it. Um, you take a paper clip, hope you can see my paper clip right there. I'm going to hold my paper clip, I'm going to take one end of it, and I'm just going to bend my paper clip like that. There we go, just straight down the middle. Wow, okay, what an experiment you may think. Why is that so incredible? Well, the reason that's so incredible is that this metal, which is presumably just a piece of steel, um, is fairly straightforward for me to bend with my fingers. We call it fairly plastic, it plastically deforms um, easily. Um, now, most materials are crystalline, including that uh, that uh, paper clip. It'll be a, have a crystalline structure, and really, until the sort of um, uh, uh, ninety, until the time of Hirsch's experiments or so, um, it really wasn't understood why metals were so ductile, why they could be so easily um, deformed. And this is a nice video, actually, from the. Um, uh, from this animations library, this is hosted by the University of Cambridge, a nice set of material science resources if you want to go there and, and, and look at what they have available, lots of good material science resources there. But I'm going to run this video, and this was the prevailing view of how metals deformed. If you think about metals deforming, what needs to happen is atoms need to slide over other atoms in the deformation process. And it was basically assumed that, that occurred plane by plane in these crystals. So a crystal is a, just a regular array of, of atoms, they're all nicely ordered in this regular periodic lattice. Um, and so if you want to deform it, it means that a row of these atoms need to slide over another row of atoms. And what that means is that all these bonds need to break at the same time to do that. Now, if you do the calculation of how much force that requires to break all those bonds, uh, it turns out that will give you a value with something of around a thousand, thousand times higher the force that I'm using to bend this piece of steel at the moment. In fact, with a force, if a force a thousand times higher was required, I probably wouldn't be able to do it with my fingers. Actually, it would, I just wouldn't. You know, it'd be very, very stiff. In fact, what would probably happen is the, is the steel would just fracture first before bending. Um, there'd be a would exceed the, the, the what we call the fracture stress first. So this model, this so-called block shear model, clearly didn't predict the experimental observable that we can bend steel pretty easily with our with our fingers and so it was proposed that there were defects in crystal called dislocations so this is a model of a dislocation you can see it exists of crisp perfect crystal but with this extra so-called half plane of atoms 
that terminates at this point right here. And these other planes of atoms then close up, close up the, the gap there. So these dislocations have been proposed. Why would they make bending an easier process? Well, let's look at the movie now of what happens if we have a dislocation present. Uh, it takes a little while to start. Here we go. Now you can see here's the dislocation. Here's the extra row of atoms. And you can see actually as this extra row of atoms propagates across the material, we only have to break one row of bonds at a time, not the entire set between these two planes. And so it makes the whole process of displacing the atoms relative to each other and this whole shearing process much easier by having this uh, defect called this dislocation, which then propagates through the material, moves through the material, and is allowing these atoms to slide over each other. The problem was that until the experiments that Peter Hirsch conducted, no one really had any direct experimental, experimental evidence for the existence of these dislocations. And it became, they became hugely controversial and a very contentious issue about whether these dislocations actually existed or not. Um, so back to uh, Peter Hirsch and the experiment. What you'll notice is that there's a camera here, an old fashioned movie camera, peering down through the window at the so-called viewing screen in the microscope, the screen where the images appear. It's actually inside the vacuum. Microscopes have to be inside a vacuum. Uh, because otherwise the electrons wouldn't be able to propagate, they would just crash into air molecules. And so for electron microscopes, we have to have them in a vacuum to let the electrons propagate. We've got a window to seal the vacuum, and the camera looks through the glass at the viewing um, chamber. And thankfully, they recorded video, videos of what they saw, and I'm going to play them for you. So uh, this starts off, it's, uh, as you say, this is movie, movies recorded in, in 1956. It's a bit like a sort of silent movie. You almost expect some sort of piano or something be playing alongside. I'm just going to kind of scroll forward a little bit because this gets a bit tedious. Now, here we go. This is what we're looking at. These are these dislocation defects being seen in an electron microscope. And as the foil heats up under the electron beam, it starts to deflect a little bit. And you can see these dislocations all start to move. And so this was the first direct evidence of dislocations existing and that the motion of them allowed the deformation of, 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 of metals. So this really was groundbreaking and confirmed really the existence of dislocations. Uh, let's just scroll on to something. This is aluminium. Oh, uh, here we go. Uh, see what we see. So there's a dislocation moving very rapidly through the material right there as the aluminium uh, deforms. So this was really, if you like, incontrovertible, incontrovertible evidence of the existence of, of, of dislocations and, and, and very exciting really. And this really enabled us to then think about how to use electron microscopes to study the propagation of dislocations and understand how to then limit motion of dislocations to make materials harder and stronger uh, and, and so on. And, and really that's one of the been one of the important parts of material science since this first observation of materials of, of dislocations in the in the 1950s. What we often do now, for example, with aluminium alloys, many of you will have bikes made with aluminium alloys. And in those aluminium alloys, there is their impurities such as copper, which form little uh, clumps called precipitates inside the aluminium. And these little clumps or precipitates stop the dislocations moving, um, stop the material deforming, and makes uh, the material uh, much stronger, uh, deforms much less easily. And that's important if you had a bike, uh, if your bike did not have these little uh, copper precipitates in stopping the dislocations moving, lots of dislocations moving there in the video, then your bike would very, very quickly deform, the frame would just bend and, and it would be entirely, entirely useless. Okay, now there is a fundamental problem. If we're thinking about these dislocations, we want to look at them, say, at atomic resolution, really see the atomic details of these dislocations. We might think of using our electron microscope to see those atomic details. But there is a fundamental problem that electron lenses, to put it bluntly, are completely are not they are, they are not high quality lenses, I should say. Um, what a electron lens is actually made of is a magnetic field. We actually just wind a lot of copper around in a coil. We use this magnetic material to generate a strong magnetic field across a gap. So we have like a north element there and a south element there to make a very strong magnet. And the very strong magnet in this gap acts as a focusing element for the electron beam, which runs down through the center. Of this coil uh, and this is called this area here is known as the as, as the pole piece so electron lenses are made out of magnetic fields and Otto Scherzer in 1936 shortly after the invention of the electron microscope realized that there was a problem previously when we were thinking about glass for light optics we can think of grinding a glass lens 
to any shape that we want and making the lens essentially a perfect lens that takes a, a point source of radiation and focus it back to a point here at the image plane. The problem is that our magnetic field has to obey the laws of physics such as the Maxwell equations and so we don't have a free hand over how we can shape a magnetic field. It has to obey these specific rules. Uh, and so what that means is because we can't have a arbitrarily shaped magnetic field, they always have to obey these laws of physics, we get bad aberrations. We get actually a lot of spherical aberration. And um, uh, often it's like it's, 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 uh, a spherical aberration is, is likened to, say, using, uh, say, a wine glass. And here, actually, I've got a a wine glass, rather a large one, only water in it, sadly. Uh, but you can see there's, um, uh, you can see it's a nice round wine glass. And if you pick up a wine glass yourself and, and with some liquid in it, uh, any liquid you like, wine preferably, I suppose, uh, then you can, um, you'll be able to see that it's like a lens, but it's a rather poor quality lens. There's a lot of distortion. It doesn't work very well. Um, and this is a schematic of what happens. What actually happens is the rays which have passed through higher radii in the lens go at higher angles get focused too strongly and don't cross over now at the correct point they cross over um, too early um, so this is a fundamental problem this this poor quality of lenses of this very strong spherical aberration has for many years limited the resolution of the electron microscope to really just about the distance between atoms. We've just about been able to image atoms, but really, really right on the limits of what the microscope can, can achieve. Um, it's been really frustrating that although we've got this very, very short wavelength, much shorter than the distance between the atoms, the quality of the lenses uh, means that the uh, atoms are only just about resolvable um, in, 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 the, in the microscope uh, uh, previously. But a Schurter actually came up with an answer to these very bad lenses in the electron microscope. He published this in Germany in 1947. And how to fix these bad um, aberrations of these lenses, these poor quality lenses. Um, and people tried it lots of times in the, in the subsequent years. And there really wasn't any progress until about 2000 or so, where a couple of efforts... Uh, one uh, in um, in the USA, in Seattle, a company called Neon, which in fact I spent four years working with from 2000 to 2004. And another one in Germany called uh, CIOS, uh, were able to successfully develop correctors for these um, uh, bad aberrations of electron lenses. And by correctors, what we essentially are saying, if you like, is spectacles from the microscope, a way of fixing the bad aberrations of the lenses. If you yourselves wear, wear glasses, you'll know that essentially the, the reason you're wearing glasses is because your eyes have bad aberrations and the spectacles are correctors for those aberrations. We've done exactly the same thing with, with electron microscopes. And I don't want to go into the details of how these work. They're quite complex, but ways we, we borrow technology from the beam lines like CERN and, and synchrotrons and so on, where they use non-round lenses, such as these are things called quadrupoles, which have alternating positive and negative poles or north and south magnetic fields. Um, and octopoles, which have eight poles alternating like that. And we squeeze the beam into all sorts of weird shapes and stretch it and distort it. And overall, by using these non-round elements in combination, we can create an overall ele uh, element called a corrector, which um, fixes um, the sphere collaboration of the electron lenses. Now, these are not cheap. They'll cost you about a half a million pounds for one of these correctors. So a little bit more expensive than a pair of spectacles, but they work and they do in fact fix the sphere collaboration of electron lenses. Um, and here's a result uh, one that I took back in 2004, looking at a piece of silicon. Now, silicon is a crystal. In the electron microscope, we're actually looking right through the crystal. We're projecting right through the, the crystal. So rather than seeing individual atoms, we're actually seeing rows of atoms lined up. Um, and, and this is a, a, uh, an image of silicon viewed along a particular crystallographic axis, which we call the 112 axis, looking at a certain direction through the crystal. And in this orientation, uh, the atoms line up to give these so-called atomic columns, and each column is separated from the other. These little pairs are just uh, 78 picometers apart. And when we looked at this uh, sample in the microscope with this corrector running, and I hope you can see it, you can see that we're actually, rather than getting a single blob for these pairs, they're now resolving into two distinct blobs. And so we were able to resolve that there were actually two separate atomic columns uh, here being viewed in, in projections. That really demonstrated 
um, that the aberration correctors work. Okay, that's the end of this section. Um, in the next section, we're going to talk then about applications. Um, we're now going to move on to talk a little bit about some of the applications of the types of microscopes that I've been talking about. And to start with, I just need to introduce uh, very simply the scanning transmission electron microscope because uh, all of the data I'm going to show you from now on pretty much is all taken in the scanning transmission electron microscope. And the principle of this microscope is very straightforward. We actually use all those nice electron optics that I've just been talking about, the aberration corrector and so on. And what we can do is focus our beam of electrons down to form a small spot. So we focus our beam of electrons using all these nice lenses to form a spot. And we then scan the spot across the sample in what we call a raster pattern. And that's a sort of essentially a sort of left to right scanning across, down across the whole of the image area. And for each position of this illuminating probe, we can collect some scattering by the by the sample. And a very typical uh, thing to do is to use something called the annular dark field detector. And what that does is collects relatively high angles of electron scattering out to this big annular detector. All this detector does is just adds up all the scattering out to these high angles. And we can display the strength of that scattering as a function of this illuminating proposition to give us an image. And the great strength of this so-called annular dark field imaging mode is that the strength of the scattering out to these relatively high angles is highly dependent on atomic number. So you get a contrast which is very, very dependent on atomic number. Heavier elements with higher atomic number show up much more bright, brightly than, than um, lower atomic number uh, elements. We also could actually use here a, a pixelated camera um, to record a diffraction pattern. I'm going to come back to that a little bit later. Just moving on, these are the sorts of instruments that we use, that I've used for the sort of uh, experiments I'm going to show you. This is in, in our own lab here in Oxford. Um, this is actually at Superstem uh, Darlesbury. Uh, some of you may have visited Superstem at some point. Uh, and this one here is at the, uh, cent the Harwell Centre, which is down near Didcot, just in, in the south part of, of, of Oxfordshire. Had you been able to come to the summer school here in Oxford, you'd have actually got to see this machine and potentially even operate it a little bit and do some experiments um, on this on this machine. Um, so uh, they, the typical cost of these machines, by the way, is somewhere around three to four million pounds. So they're quite expensive instruments, but great fun to, to play with. So um, let's move on to the first application, which is around the materials for low energy lighting, because lighting uses about a fifth of the world's electricity production. So it's a big consumer of electricity, a big contributor to carbon and uh, greenhouse gases, greenhouse gases and so on. Uh, and the old style, you don't really see these around now, but the old style incandescent light bulb, once it heats up, gets hot, is only about 5% efficient, which is terrible, really. Most of that energy you're putting into that light bulb, um, you're losing 95% of that energy you're, you're, you're losing. But if we can use light emitting diodes, and, and of course, many of you will have light emitting diodes in your bike lights or in um, lighting in your, in your homes, um, then um, they can be 80% efficient or better. And they're based on a material called gallium nitride, which is a, a wide band gap semiconductor uh, material. Now, the uh, interesting thing about gallium nitride is that uh, we cannot grow gallium nitride without a very high density of dislocations. And we talked about dislocations already in, in, in the context of things bending. Here, actually, the reason we cannot grow gallium nitride without a very high density of dislocations is because the substrates, the gallium nitride is a synthetic material. We have to grow it in the lab. We can't just dig it up out of a mine. Um, and you have to grow it on other substrates. And it doesn't, doesn't lattice match very well the other substrates that we grow it on, including sapphire uh, and silicon carbide. And so because it doesn't match very well with these other substrates that we grow it on, the crystal structures don't match very well, then it just naturally grows with a very high density of these dislocations in the material and they can lower the efficiency and the longevity of the uh, light emitting diode uh, materials. So, they, so studying these dislocations is of great interest. So here's an image that I took of one of these dislocations in gallium nitride. Gallium nitride is a hexagonal, has a hexagonal crystal structure. You can see how the atoms line up into these lovely little hexagon patterns. And uh, if you look in here, here's the dislocation core right here. And you can see this, the, the, the um, uh, lattice has been disrupted. You may remember that I, when I mentioned a dislocation core, I said there's this extra extra half plane, partial plane of atoms. In this case, the extra half partial plane is coming in from the right hand side, finishes right here. And if we zoom in on this area, you can see that rather than having a nice hexagon here, we've got a, a, a seven atoms in a ring there, 
and then next to it five atoms in a ring so these this the the heart of the dislocation the dislocation core as we call it is composed of this seven membered ring and a five membered ring now thinking about gallium nitride being a compound where gallium likes to bond to nitrogen and nitrogen likes to bond to gallium think about whether there's an issue with having seven and five membered rings in the material and we'll talk a little bit about that in the q a session afterwards if there's one available here's a completely different dislocation which had never been seen before which we spotted uh, and this one is an elongated dislocation core you can see it running right across there, strange looking looking thing. And we looked at this in some detail and realized that I don't want to go into the details of this if you're interested in come and study material science, but this is what's known as a Klein dissociated dislocation core. And the dislocation core extends over a, a whole region of the crystal that lowers its energy and you have this rather much more complicated dislocation core structure. Uh, and this has never been observed before and we were able to, to spot this and we published this back in back in 2013. So um, now, um, studying these dislocation cores allows us to understand how they affect the properties of the of the, of the light emitting diode. But also, we can understand that when we look at their structure, we can understand how to try and reduce the number of dislocations that exist in the in the material. And here's a, a slightly different application. This is actually a material that's used uh, as a uh, in, in a supercapacitor. A supercapacitor is a device that can store an awful lot of energy and release it very quickly way of releasing energy very quickly in applications we need a fast release of electrical energy and this is a, the um this is used as the dielectric in a in a um in a, in a super capacitor this is um uh, actually the material we're looking at here is mn304 manganese oxide now what happens in this material when we started looking at it in the electron microscope the electron beam started damaging the the, the material and it started transforming into MNO, so it's got a different stoichiometry, different chemistry, and the structure changes. This is a more complicated structure called a spinel crystallographic structure. This one's a bit simpler, and it's actually the same as rock salt, same as sodium chloride. Um, excuse me, so, so um, what we're gonna do, watch as I play this video, is the transformation from this spinel structure into this sodium chloride occurring in real time in the microscope. And if you watch some of these atoms, you'll see them start to do a little kind of uh, little dance uh, jigging back and forth before they finally transform uh, from one structure into the other structure. So what we're able to do in the electron microscope in this way is actually watch these transformations, we call them phase transformations, changing from one structure into another real time inside the microscope. We can watch these changes occurring and watch where the atoms are going, which is very exciting. Moving on to a different problem. Allotropes of carbon. These are all allotropes of carbon, different structures of carbon. And again, in the Q&A session, I might ask you what you think they all are. This one down here, I'll tell you, this is a carbon nanotube. And these are um, uh, of, of wide interest for a whole range of applications. And the one we're going to talk about here is its potential use as a drug delivery system. And this is work that I did in collaboration with Ben Davis and his student, Ryder Ruter who are in the Department of Chemistry here, here at Oxford. And their idea was that you take a carbon nanotube like this, you treat it as a bottle, and you can put a drug inside the carbon nanotube. Then what you do is what we call functionalize the end of the carbon nanotube. By functionalizing, that means we can start to attach other chemical um, molecules to the end of the carbon nanotube. And the molecule that they attached is actually a peptide chain. And here it is. Uh, essentially consisting of these amino acids uh, and this peptide chain has two configurations one is with oh sorry what I should have said is at the end of the peptide chain is a fullerene which is another allotrope of carbon buckyball and there's two configurations of this peptide chain one is with the peptide chain such that the buckyball sits at the end of the nanotube and the other one is when it pulls out the um, the the buckyball and it's floating out here in space and this process of pulling out the buckyball can be activated by a particular biological configuration so the um uh, the idea here is that when you normally take a drug it just floods your entire system and it's not localized to where it's needed it just goes everywhere in your body the idea here is that if you could do this this would float around your body but it wouldn't release the drug from inside the carbon nanotube until it reached the right biological setting inside the body, which would activate the peptide chain, pull out the the, uh, uh, the fullerene molecule, and release the, the the drug. Problem is that this is a very complicated system to try and image. So, so the student Ryder couldn't actually work out whether she had, uh, had been able to create this material or not. And the problem is looking at the carbon structures. Carbon doesn't scatter electrons very strongly. Um, 
Um, but this is where we can use this other detector down here, which actually records the full scattering as a function of pixel. This is like a camera that can run very quickly. For each illuminating pro position, this camera records all of the scattering over all the different angles. And we can then end up with what we call a four dimensional data set. For each two dimensional pro position during the scan of the probe, we record this two dimensional map of the detector plane of all the scattering that's going on against this four dimensional um, data set. Um, now, these are a little bit like holograms. You may have come across holograms, um, ways of, of capturing uh, lots of optical information in a, in a hologram. It's a lovely 3D effect. Um, with these holograms, we can also. Um, uh, use them to get hold of very very weak scattering effects of the of the electrons and actually detect the carbon so this is what the data looks like these are the holograms they look awful it's noisy splodgy things this is as the probe is scanning it doesn't look like it does very much at all but we can process these holograms uh and now i'm not going to go through all the details of the of the mathematics is the mathematics is a, is a bit gruesome it all exists in what we call four-dimensional reciprocal space um, if you're interested in that ask me um but uh, the reason i show you this mathematics is because it just shows you how mathematics comes into all areas of science and we really need maths to help us to unlock techniques that we can use to understand uh, a wide range of scientific problems um okay so these are this is the data we got we actually as well as forming uh these images from these holograms to give us the position of the carbon. We also were running our annular dark field detector, which I already discussed, which gave us bright spot splotches uh, at the position of iodine atoms. And I forgot to mention that the peptide chains are labeled with iodine atoms. So we can see the iodine um, atoms. Now we can interpret what we're seeing here now. Here's the carbon nanotube. Now, first problem you can see it, it's a double walled carbon nanotube whereas they had planned to use single-walled carbon nanotubes. So it's a double wall. Secondly, it's too wide. It's the diameter is too large. And so these fullerene molecules, rather than just acting as a stopper at the end, have been sucked down inside it like a straw. So all these fullerene molecules are shot down inside it. And if we now correlate where the iodine atoms are relative to the fullerenes, we can see that the fullerenes have taken their peptide chains with them and their iodine molecules. So they've kind of gone down with their peptide chains and their and their ID molecules. So we're able to understand here that the synthesis hasn't actually gone perfectly. There's a lot of things that need to be modified in the um, in this in this uh, synthesis. But this is the sort of information that chemists need to develop their processes. We can see directly what the product is of the reaction and then for chemists can go away and optimize uh, their, their reaction. So just to wrap up this, this lecture, then let me just make a few final points. Um, a big challenge in material science is to make the structure property relationship. And what that means is that if we can understand how the structure of materials affects the properties of materials, then we can think about how to modify the structure, how to engineer the structure of materials to create materials with the properties that we want to create new applications of materials, materials that can withstand harsher environments or can generate more electricity in the form of photovoltaics for example and to be able to do that we need to be able to then see the structure and a modern electron microscopy um, can see atoms and then can play a, a crucial role in developing this structure property relationship and in supporting the development of, of new materials and perhaps the, the final point and one of the reasons that i've ended up uh, working in electron microscopy is it's really good fun to actually be able to see materials uh, at the atomic resolution and look at atoms directly in materials and see how those atoms are arranged and how they're interacting with each other. So perhaps I'll just finish with a picture of myself operating one of the microscopes that we have here in the department. This is one of our atomic resolution microscopes um, and uh, that we use for looking at atoms in materials. Thank you for your time.